uh, is becoming more and more evident to everybody is we need to act urgently and move from events to achievements to stop what the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, called as a climate carnage. I quote. We do not have much time to get back on track and keep the climate emergency under control. And we know that what will be decided in Sharm el-Sheikh will shape the climate and energy policies of the EU and of member states and have an impact on all local and regional authorities and even beyond the EU on the entire world. The decisions at COP27 will be taken at, in the middle of possibly the worst energy crisis ever, with worrying peaks of energy poverty affecting vulnerable families, small companies, local authorities all over the EU. But this should not take us by surprise. The climate crisis was exacerbated by Putin's invasion of Ukraine. But, as I had the opportunity to mention yesterday, the reason why we must address this issue, the reason why we must reduce our dependency on fossil fuels, for example, should not be because of the invasion because we should be doing that for decades now. I will now open the debate with a first round of interventions. And I have here at the podium Mr. Bas Ekut, Mr. Traskowski, De Ms. Deixma, our colleague Alison Gilliland, our colleague Geblevich, and Chalstowski. We see that uh, we will see that uh, Mr. Sefiani is connected. And uh, as first speaker, I'm happy to welcome MEP Bas Ekut, member of the European Parliament, vice chair of the ENVI committee. Welcome to the Committee of the Regions. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I will, without further delay, give you the floor. You have the floor for five minutes? Five minutes. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's good to be here um, because, indeed, as, as, as you already said, these are crucial times from a climate perspective, but certainly also from a energy security perspective, and I think we all know that very well, what the challenges are. Um, and I think, indeed, uh, the time for climate action has never been so clear before. On the one hand, if you look at the impacts, and I think we all from the different regions of Europe uh, have seen the impacts of climate change during this summer, uh, um, so, so, and, and, and I think, of course, that's not even the only impact that we've seen, and probably quite often, as an example, will also be mentioned Pakistan, for example, if you look at the flooding and the impacts over there, where one-third of the country is being flooded. And these kind of impacts will, we will see more and more, and will also shape the negotiations in Sharm el-Sheikh. Because for a very long time, climate change was, of course, dominated by the debate on climate ambition. What are we going to do to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases? Um, then, for a very long while, of course, adaptation has been at the forefront as well. Uh, but more and more, we will need to discuss loss and damage, the impacts of climate change that will happen even if we have adaptation in place. And this third element was introduced already during the Paris Climate Summit in 2015, but is one of the kind of most sticking elements in the international negotiations on what does that mean 
and how will it look like if we are going to embrace and further work on issues like loss and damage. I will get back to that on, on what I think will be uh, happening in Sharm el Sheikh uh, this November. But I think what is very important then first, of course, is also to make sure that we as Europe have our own house in order. And that's, of course, exactly what we are working on as we speak in uh, negotiations at the European level. On the one hand, there is the famous a Fit for 55 package that will bring the European Union to deliver on, climate, on greenhouse gas reductions of uh, 55% by 2030. But on top of that, and, and you, Mr. Chair, already, Mr. President, already said that and alluded to that, uh, due to the war in Ukraine, there's also now a very clear push to accelerate the energy transition, to faster get our energy system independent of fossils, and certainly, of course, of Russian fossils, but in fossils in general is going to be the big challenge. So Fit for 55 and an acceleration of Fit for 55, especially on energy savings and on renewables, renewable energy, is what is on the agenda. And is also, I think, important that some of these elements will be closed before we go to Sharm el Sheikh. Um, you all know that the European Union sometimes can be quite uh, tedious and long in negotiations, but I think we cannot really uh, maintain that pace, and we have to accelerate our pace, and all the negotiators are very well aware. Uh, but then, of course, still the, the big question is, what can we deliver before we go into Sharm el Sheikh? Because that's basically in three weeks' time. So the time is pressing. I think uh, what you will can expect is that some of these files, some of these elements of Fit for 55 can be concluded and will be concluded before we go. Uh, and one on that will be on land use change policies, which will really also, if we do it well, increase our reduction target even beyond 55. So then also as a European Union, we can show that we are doing even more than the 55 percent, which is on the table and is possible if we do it right. I also think one of the other files, which is always a bit of a sensitive one, but an important one because everyone understands this on CO2 and cars, the end of the combustion engine, which is in the cars too, that that will be concluded that by 2035 Europe will not deliver any combustion engine on the European market anymore. And also that is a delivery which of course will have an impact in the international negotiations. So that's on the one hand what Europe could and should deliver when we go to Sharm el Sheikh on climate ambition. But as I said, the main other element in the discussion will be on loss and damage. Not only talking about climate adaptation anymore, but also really how do we deal with the impacts of climate change that we will see, that we have seen, and that we uh, will see more and more. And here I really think that it's going to be important, and this is my last plea also to here to the Committee of Regions, is that we hopefully can get to a situation where it's also the regions, the regional, uh, uh, regional governments can show what they are doing on climate action, on mitigation, on adaptation, because this is what needs to happen in the regions, of course, but also that we are all very well aware that the next debate that we also need to have within Europe, how are we going to deal with the impacts of climate change, which is then framed as loss and damage in the international negotiations. And this is where, of course, the role of regional authorities is becoming more and more important because the impacts we will all feel at home more. And I think that will be certainly, uh, at Sharm el Sheikh, an important topic to address and where people will expect more from us Europeans as well. I think I'll leave it to that because it's sort of five minutes. <laughs> kind of. Kind of, I know. Mr. Joskowski uh, is our member, is, uh, is the chair of the COR and the Commission. Now it's my pleasure to give you the floor for five minutes. Yes, muito obrigado, Presidente. And the Mayor of Warsaw. Uh, well, f yes. first of all, yes, f f first of all, uh, I wanted to tell you that when Paris Agreement was negotiated, we thought that there is a problem for the next generation. Uh, the problem is for us. It's not for the next generation. And uh, I think that the situation is much worse uh, than many of us think. Uh, uh, Mr. Eckhout was uh, saying that many people now want to accelerate. And yes, that's exactly what we should do. We should accelerate the energy transition. But there are many in Europe who think that we should uh, actually stop or procrastinate because of what's, uh, what are the problems uh, around us. 
And of course, the problem uh, and the multiple crises that are around us are incredibly serious because we are getting out of uh, the pandemic. We have a very serious war on our eastern border and we have an energy crisis with crazy energy prices and with people thinking that they might not be able to sustain themselves throughout the winter. And of course, many will use that argument to say, OK, guys, we cannot be that ambitious. We have to stop for a while and we have to focus on what's uh, the most important thing, getting us through the winter. And that's our biggest problem, because we have to do both. We have to help the people, but we cannot lose our ambitions from sight. And of course, uh, the voice of the local and regional authorities is absolutely crucial at that moment, because at the end of the day, we are the ones implementing all of those measures. And at the end of the day, we are the ones who are at the forefront of all these challenges. And sometimes we have uh, difficult governments in our countries which are not sharing our ambitions. That's why we need to go to Sharm el-Sheikh and make sure that our voice is being heard. We've been talking about EU sovereignty for years. And of course, some member states didn't hear it because they thought that they could make themselves dependent on Russia because it's a normal democratic country. How many times have we heard that? And other countries, such as mine, didn't think that uh, adapting to climate change uh, should happen quickly. And they stopped the whole transition or they slowed it down. So we do have uh, our, ser our, our share of serious problems. And that's why we should do everything we can to create those synergies between European institutions, synergies between uh, member states who want to be ambitious, uh, institutions who want to be ambitious, and us, people on the ground responsible for actually implementing these measures as mayors of the cities, as councillors who take decisions, and of course as regional leaders. And that's why uh, we need uh, not only to prepare our position and talk to our partners so that we are in sync and we're speaking in the same language, that we are on the same page, but that our message is clearly heard and that's what we are going to, uh, to do. At the same time, taking care of the energy poverty, of helping people in distress, because at the end of the day, this is really our responsibility, our prime responsibility. But we cannot forget about uh, what we need to do, because no one will, uh, no one will forgive us if we were to stop the transition. And of course, Europe needs to be more and more independent, and Europe needs to be more and more green. We need to lead by example. And for that, we need to use all of our contacts, all of uh, our possible means, also when it comes to contacting international uh, players uh, through uh, organizations such as C40. And the Committee of the Regions has a crucial role uh, to play. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, thank in Parliament. This is very important so I'd like to thank the uh, Atlantic Committee of the Republic for referencing uh, us uh, as a resolution of the role of the cities and regions. It's absolutely important. I think that uh, support our colleagues from the European Parliament and, and the institutions which are responsible for the legislative our process uh, is going to be supported by our voice. I think that we can be more effective and lead the way and make people uh, aware that in times of crises, multiple crises, that's the time where, where, where you need to think out of the box. That's the time when you, you need to be ambitious. We're not going to do it without financing. Because uh, in this dire situation where the recovery uh, plan is blocked for some countries for the irresponsible uh, behavior of the government. We need the financing. That's why we are going to also come back to the idea of direct financing, all the financing for the cities, especially the cities which are ambitious, such as the ones which are in cities. Uh, I would like to make a plea. Let's be proactive together. Uh, dear President, dear members, I'm aware that we cannot make the climate change disappear from one day to another, uh, but we need to make sure that Egypt is not a huge disappointment and that the situation does not get any worse. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Rafał Traskowski, mayor of Warsaw, member of the CMR, and newly elected chair of the Envy Commission. Now, that's a brass order. Now it's my pleasure and honor to give the floor to Ms. Sharon, Sharon uh, Deixma, Mayor of Utrecht and ICLEI Europe Envoy to COP 
27. Mayor, you have the floor for five minutes. Well, um, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm here as a mayor and in, indeed as a special envoy uh, on behalf of the city network within the UN framework to the United Nations Cup in Sharm el Sheikh. And um, I have a task, and that is actually to bring out uh, the voice of the cities much more on the international level and also within the UN discussion. And um, I have to tell you that, that I, I see that it is not so easy to do this. Because uh, until now, you see that the voices of cities are informal voices. Most of the time, voices that are not... Yes, today here, um, I think that we are preaching to the converted... Mike is having a... I think we have a technical problem with the sound system. And uh, our technical staff asks us for a two-minute review the system. I'm sorry, that is happening. Can you try? <laughs> Do you guarantee it's back and functioning normally? <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> uh, that's what not, that was not what I asked. <laughs> I don't know what was the issue, so I hope it's, uh, it's okay. When you have an answer for me? Yeah. It seems to be uh, you're wrong. Yeah. 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 But the problem is it was on. Yeah, yeah, I know. It I know. Was, yeah. So you guarantee I can start? Yeah. Okay. I don't think I... Thank you. Don't be nervous, it can happen. Please, go ahead. And I'm sorry once. It's okay. So I restart, no problem. Um, I, uh, oh, I get an additional minute. Very good. Good. <laughs> So, good morning. Um, uh, I, I have to maybe also tell you something about myself, because I'm not only the mayor of Utrecht. For those of you who are not familiar with the Netherlands, Utrecht is the fourth largest city, and we're one of the so-called 100 cities which are selected by the European Commission uh, to be carbon neutral by 2030, which is a big challenge, as you all uh, know. But in the uh, uh, year 2015, I was a minister for the environment on behalf of the Netherlands. And in that position, I was able to negotiate on behalf of the European Union, at that time with Commissioner Kanyete, on uh, the Paris Agreement. And I felt at that time already, and I think that many of you will have had the same, that it was an historic event. But in the years that followed, uh, we really didn't do things very well. So a game changer is necessary. And I think the previous speakers told you why this is so important. And in my opinion, uh, cities could be that game changer. Because uh, in 2040 or 50, almost 70% of the people worldwide will live in the cities. Many of the pollution which takes place in the cities. And at the same time, you see that cities all over the world are part of the solution. 
because they are more progressive in their policy on climate, for instance. They understand why it's necessary to have clean air for the and uh, therefore, working yeah, it's so important that the cities do have the formal position that they uh, really need. And it means that um, uh, we work now together with the Egyptian presidency on several initiatives to really uh, give the cities more of a podium uh, also in the international stage. First of all, uh, for the first time, there will be a multi-governance high-level and ministerial uh, meeting with mayors on 17 November in Sharm el-Sheikh. And there we will discuss an initiative on sustainable uh, urban climate policy in which we try to bring the voice of cities further. Because cities need uh, access not only to expertise, but also to means in order to get their climate policy uh, in order. And I think that that is a very uh, important in initiative, and I'm really happy with the support of the Egyptian presidency for it. And I uh, uh, have organized that um, we have a call to action in which we state how relevant uh, this voice of the cities has to be. And it means that um, uh, I really hope that all of you would like to subscribe this call to action uh, because we need to make uh, uh, our voice heard. And um, at this moment, still, uh, cities are an informal part of COP. And although it is the first time that multi-level uh, covenants will be discussed at COP in Sharm el-Sheikh, I hope it is the last time that cities do not have a formal position within COP. So I really think that there is a possibility to make it happen. Uh, the Egyptian presidency is uh, cooperating with us. UN Habitat is cooperating with us. And also the secretariat of the UNFCC is cooperating with us. So I hope that uh, also today we all understand how uh, important it is to, to really uh, get the cities uh, much more at the forefront on the international uh, stage. And uh, there we need to make the change. Because a lot of things that, that my both neighbors have been saying are things that will happen uh, in, in our cities. And, and I think that you agree with me that that is really important. So I thank you again for having me here uh, to stress out uh, what we need to do. And um, I uh, really hope that we see in Sharm el-Sheikh a new dawn uh, in this. And probably we can see the sun very well there. So let's hope for the best. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your inputs and insights about, um, about this, uh, this issue. Now it is my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Mohamed Sefiani, is mayor of Chefchaouen, is the ICLEI Africa chair. Welcome to the committee of the regions, and you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, distinguished members of the European Committee of the Regions. I am delighted to join you in my capacity of the chair of Italy Africa Regional Executive Committee and the Italy's COP27 Special Envoy for Africa. I am also sending my warmest regards from the UCLG World Congress in Daejeon in the Republic of Korea, where I am connecting to you virtually. At uh, the out outset, I would like to comment the leadership of the Committee of the Regions in climate and subnational diplomacy as a long-term and passionate partner of the LGMA constituency to the UNFCCC. I am delighted to hear the renewed collaboration between ICLE and the Committee of the Regions. As a concrete example of this collaboration, I am happy in here that this event is also announced as part of the Daring Cities Forum 2022 agenda towards COP27. 
through this opportunity, let me also congratulate Mayor Rafael Z Zakowski for his elections as the new chair of the Environment Commission. Councillor Alison Gilliland in drafting of the COP27 position. At COP27, ICLE will proudly continue its collaboration with the Committee of the Regions through multi-level action, pavilion, and other events. As you heard from Mayor Distma, the surge initiative and the first ever ministerial meeting of urbanization and climate are among the more concrete agenda for cities and regions at COP27. A holistic, multi-level and inclusive approach to sustainable urbanization and multi-level action as a regular agenda item under the UNFCCC process in a decades-long position of ICLE and LG Mayor Constitution. I am informed that the of regular dialogues between Minister of Environment and Minister of Urbanization at the UNFCCC Fora was proposed by ICLE at the first UNFCCC workshop on urbanization at COP18 in Warsaw in 2013. As the mayor of Shifshawan, intermediate city in Morocco, as mayor of, from Africa, world's youngest and fastest urbanizing continent, I am particularly excited that such exciting and innovative initiatives are being developed at a time when Africa will be hosting and leading climate negotiations. Therefore, therefore ICLE commence the Egyptian COP27 presidency for this bold leadership as a concrete response to the spirit of multi-level and cooperative action and the Glaxo Climate Pact, and is excited to collaborate with UN Habitat to deliver this ideas constitutively. But let's remember, both surge initiative and urbanization and climate ministerial require strong support from both mayors and ministers around the world in order to succeed at COP27. Therefore, I am delighted to join Mayor Disma, Disma in all the consultations since the World Urban Forum in June 2022. Under the leadership of Mayor Disma, this call to action is extremely important and essential, and therefore, I invite the Committee of the Regions and its member to endorse this call towards and at COP27. Not that primary goal of both surge and the ministerial is to ensure sustainable urbanization and multi-level action becomes a permanent agenda item in the UNFCCC process and upon additional financial channels for cities and regions, in particular in the Global South. In my capacity as ICLE's COP27 Special Envoy for Africa, I am delighted to hear that leading countries of Africa, such uh, as uh, South Africa and my country, Morocco, have already announced their support and endorsement to surge initiative. Europe has historical responsibility in climate change and has been praised by its long-term leadership in driving ambitious global climate action as well demonstrating good practice of multi-level multi-level governance. But as, but as of today, there is still no European or global North government that has explicit, explicit support to this initiative. Therefore, it's important that members of the Committee of the region speak to their government and the, and the European Union to support the surge initiative, as well as the first ever ministerial on urbanization and climate. And finally, the agenda after COP27 is equally important and the global stock tech is one of the most important processes in this regard. I commend the active engagement, engagement of the Committee of the Regions in this, the first technical dialogue in June 22 and leading the submission on adaptation. So the successful UNFCCC advocacy 
of the LGMA constitution in June 22, the global stock take is now open to contribution for all cities around the world, similar to the spirit of the Talanoa Dialogues in 2018. In this regard, on behalf of ICLI, I also would like to invite the, the Committee of the Regions and its members to actively engage the, in localization of the global stock tech in the first half of 23, which will be granted stock tech for climate emergency. Thank you. I thank you for your interest, kind invitation. I look forward to working with all members for the COP27 delegation. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you um, for your input. Now, uh, dear members, as you are aware, we have now a debate on three opinions that um, are related to this uh, issue. We have the first one is about the COR's role in boosting subnational climate diplomacy ahead of COP27 and COP28. Uh, the rapporteur is our member, uh, Geblevich. We have another opinion towards a structural inclusion of cities and regions in United Nations uh, climate COP27 from our member, uh, Gilland. And we have the third one uh, about energy package on gas, hydrog hydrogen, and methane emissions. From our, the rapporteur is our member, Chalsowski. Now I will give the floor to Olgert Geblevich for five minutes for the presentation of his opinion. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I'm very proud that I'm not only a reporter on this opinion, but, but I'm representing the, uh, the, one of the greenest regions in Poland. I'm a president of West Pomerania region, the biggest green producer of green energy in Poland that covers 82% uh, covers of our regional, uh, regional consumption. Uh, so we have a lot of experience in our region, but I, I'm, I'm sure that we have all in our cities and our regions, very good example. And we would like to share with those examples with our neighbors, because if we want to be really ambitious, and we, if we would like to really implement the, 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 on the full scale our very ambitious goals, uh, climate goals, we have to convince our neighbors to do the same, because we are not alone on the planet Earth. So, the, 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 my opinion, uh, is going to strengthen in subnational di climate diplomacy. Uh, we have a lot of twin cities all around the world, outside, of, outside of Europe. In the Committee of Regions, we have platforms such as Arlem, Corlib, joint uh, committees, joint group, uh, to work together hand in hand with our uh, neighboring countries. And we should use it as a tool to strengthen uh, climate ideas, climate goals. Uh, of course, there is a lot to do because we, don't, we know that in the uh, neighboring country situation not, is not very easy. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the governments in these countries are not very convinced to, uh, to ambitious climate goals. So our way of thinking is that boosting climate diplomacy, we are working on the ground with, with our friends in our neighboring cities. And thanks to that, we had exert a pressure from the bottom to the national government in the neighboring countries, uh, in, the, in the Africa, in the East, uh, and thanks to that, be, be, be more successful. In my opinion, uh, I uh, urge to, uh, to boosting this subnational diplomacy, but I see still the missing legal framework on the rules of cooperation between the cities regions on the national level, uh, on subnational level, the lack of funding, of course, the missing on incomplete information on existing ex initiative on the European level, and uh, lack of investment on local and regional governments in the uh, prepara uh, preparation of nationally determined contribution. It, it should be 
uh, certainly changed. And uh, I suggest that, uh, or, or I propose that COR should uh, start playing a coordinating role, representing the position of regal, uh, regional and local authorities from the EU during COP uh, meetings. And I think that it should be obvious for all of us that we should be a coordinator. And last not, but not least, uh, I would like to draw attention that uh, after this very bloody uh, war on Ukraine, re Ukraine should be rebuilt, and it should, it, it should be rebuilt as an example of, of green rebuilding. Of, uh, it, uh, Ukraine should be the green uh, example uh, how to achieve the common uh, global climate goals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amber Gilliland, you will have the floor for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. President, distinguished speakers, dear members. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the collaborative approach to my opinion and thank all the stakeholders and members who have engaged with it, and particularly my expert, expert Ms. Georgia Rambelli, uh, Teresa Garcia Perez of the NV Secretariat, and my PES Secretariat colleague, uh, Francisco Carteri. As we have all said, the current energy crisis and the extreme weather events of this summer has shown once again the fragility of our ecosystem and the urgent need for effective climate change now. Today, soaring prices continue to strangle our, our businesses and gobble up the wage packets of households. And we cities and regions are also seeing how unsustainable costs may undermine our ability to deliver the basic services we provide to our citizens. As Rapporteur of the Core Opinion on Towards a Structural Inclusion of Cities and Regions in UFCCC COP27, I, like many others here, are very concerned that some EU member states and bigger emitters are trying to row back in face of these challenges from what was agreed in Glasgow last year. In my opinion, I underline the implications that the war cannot stop the just and fair transition towards a cleaner, more sustainable planet. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine does not and cannot take away the urgency to fight climate change. On the contrary, it has very much confirmed the need that we need to move more swiftly away from fossil fuels and invest in renewables. Colleagues, I'd like to highlight some points in my opinion. One of our main objectives in COP27 is to see subnational governments included in the decision making, implementing and monitoring of climate and energy policies and actions. Based on the recognition of the urgent need for multi-level and cooperative action in the Glasgow Climate Pact last year, I call on EU member states and the Czech Presidency to recognise the pivotal role of local and regional governments in advancing climate change action and in the Council conclusions that will be adopted at the end of the month. Joining with my colleagues here, I would like to also thank the NV Committee of the European Parliament for having reflected this message in its draft resolution. Our final goal is that it is recognised in the COP27 outcome documents. I would like to also welcome, as stated in my opinion, the organisation of the first ever Ministerial Conference on Climate and Urbanisation and the launch of a Presidency Initiative on Sustainable Urban Resilience for the Next Generation, Sergey. And I would very much like to thank Mayor Sharon Diskma for her work on this. Thank you. One of the main priorities of this COP is to advance the global goal on adaptation. This means that local regional authorities will have a special role to play in Sharm El Sheikh in practice. Adaptation is delivered at local level. In my opinion, I underline that a highly urbanised continent such as Europe, EU cities are in charge of providing access to safe and inclusive green spaces, sustainable housing and resilient public infrastructure. But while there is a strong emphasis on adaptation and loss this year, we cannot lose sight of mitigation. 
I call on the UNFCCC parties to formally include regionally and locally determined contributions as complementary to their national determined contributions. I also acknowledge the commitments of local and regional authorities participating in such initiatives as the Covenant of Mayors, the EU Mission on Climate Neutral and Smart Cities and the Race to Zero Initiative. With regards to mitigation, I also recognise the particular challenges of those regions currently with a heavy industrial and employment dependency. You note an emphasis on reskilling and upskilling of workforces. Finally, I emphasise that this needs to be a socially fair and just transition, and the most vulnerable citizens cannot be left behind. In this regard, in the opinion, I recognise the multi-generational dimension of change, particularly the role of our youth in driving social progress and inspiring political change. And I also highlight the importance of mainstreaming gender in climate and energy policies, as well as the need to ensure equal and meaningful female participation in decision making. And I very much want to recognise the enormous work of my colleague Katatutu in this regard. And I also want to support the contribution of my Irish colleague Una Power yesterday when she stated that we need more gender awareness in all our work. <coughs> Dear members, I would like to thank you for your support and commitment towards advancing climate action. We, EU cities and regions, are already <coughs> delivering and we want to deliver more and faster, but we are lacking the right technical and financial tools. This is why, in my opinion, I also highlight the urgent need to boost the capacity of our workforce to transition justly and the importance of making direct funding available to LRAs. Rest assured that the core delegation of which I am part will lead by example in Sharm el-Sheikh. We will voice the concerns of EU citizens. We will showcase how we are already delivering on Paris goals and we will encourage cities and regions across the EU and around the globe to come forward with more ambitious targets. Finally, we will engage with the parties to commit to a formal structure that affords our determined voices a place at the climate table and we will be the game changers that Mayor Dijksma and all of us here want to be. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to the rapporteur of the next opinion, our colleague Chaustowski. You have the floor for five minutes. Szanowny panie przewodniczący, szanowni państwo, ja reprezentuję województwo śląskie, jeden z najbardziej uprzemysłowionych regionów w Polsce. Dziękuję bardzo za możliwość przedstawienia projektu opinii Europejskiemu Komitetowi Regionów w tak ważnej dla całej Unii Europejskiej kwestii, jaką jest uchwalenie nowego pakietu gazowego oraz rozporządzenia metanowego. Pragnę zaznaczyć, że oba akty prawne będące przedmiotem naszych dyskusji są kluczowe do realizacji strategicznych założeń Zielonego Ładu, a także pakietu Fit for 55 oraz Repower EU. Należy także wskazać, że kwestie rozwoju rynku wodoru, biometanu oraz ograniczenia emisji metanu będą ważne również w kontekście zbliżającego się szczytu klimatycznego COP27 w Egipcie i rozwoju naszych regionów. Kwestia ta była już zresztą tematem gorących dyskusji podczas szczytu COP26. Chciałbym wyraźnie zaznaczyć, że globalna agenda dekarbonizacyjna nie będzie mogła być realizowana bez gazów niskoemisyjnych i odnawialnych, a metan powinien być brany pod uwagę jako jeden z krytycznych gazów cieplarnianych występujący na naszej planecie po dwutlenku węgla ze względu na swoją szkodliwość. Dekarbonizacja nie uda się też bez odpowiedniego zaangażowania w nią samorządu terytorialnego. Dlatego też jako Europejski Komitet Regionów powinniśmy ze wszelką starannością podejść do opiniowania omawianych propozycji i regulacji, uwzględniając przy tym zdanie wielu interesariuszy, a także zróżnicowane pozycje wyjściowe wielu regionów Unii Europejskiej. Wypracowanie przejrzystych i spójnych przepisów powinno być naszym priorytetem. Mimo możliwości występowania różnicy zdań w zakresie koncepcji rozwoju rynku, starajmy się mówić wspólnym głosem. Jest on szczególnie ważny w kontekście obecnej sytuacji geopolitycznej oraz kryzysu energetycznego. Ostatnie miesiące pokazały, że główną bronią Rosji w walce z Unią Europejską jest, są surowce energetyczne, a w szczególności gaz ziemny. W konsekwencji wydaje się, że w obecnej sytuacji transformacja energetyczna nabiera kolejnego strategicznego wymiaru. 
Oprócz ograniczenia zmian klimatu jest również kluczowa dla przyszłości europejskiej gospodarki i kształtowania cen nośników energii. Mam nadzieję, że opracowane przez nas akty prawne będą mogły być także drogowskazem regulacyjnym dla wielu państw pozaunijnych, z którymi spotkamy się na tegorocznym COP27, pokazując, że Unia Europejska jest światowym liderem transformacji energetycznej. Strategiczne scenariusze inwestycyjne muszą zawierać komponent przejściowości i zakładać wykorzystanie obecnie budowanej infrastruktury do obsługi zarówno gazu ziemnego, jak i gazów niskoemisyjnych oraz odnawialnych. W konsekwencji wydaje się, że obecnie największym wyzwaniem europejskiej energetyki jest zapewnienie nowych i stabilnych dostaw gazu ziemnego w niskiej cenie oraz jednocześnie planowanie odejścia od niego w kierunku paliw alternatywnych. Dlatego też opiniowany przez nas nowy pakiet gazowy powinien moim zdaniem w sposób najpełniejszy uwzględniać opisywaną perspektywę przejściowości i jednoznacznie wesprzeć europejskie regiony w rozwoju nowych modeli biznesowych, infrastruktury, a także zapewnić optymalną trajektorię dekarbonizacji sektora gazowego. Pamiętajmy również o emisjach metanu, który, które mogą być i stać się kluczowym obszarem wysiłkowym, redukcyjnym Unii Europejskiej obok ograniczenia emisji dwutlenku węgla. Dodatkowo mobilizując regiony Unii Europejskiej do przejścia na alternatywne nośniki energii. W opinii przedstawiam pogląd, że wprowadzenie przepisów zawartych w rozporządzeniu metanowym będzie dodatkowym wyzwaniem technologicznym i kosztowym dla regionów Unii Europejskiej. Niemniej, e, dzięki wzrostowi obostrzeń w zakresie wycieków i emisji metanu zmieni się charakterystyka struktur handlowych, a także dojdzie do modernizacji infrastruktury operacyjnej. W konsekwencji można uznać, że przepisy w zakresie redukcji emisji metanu mogą dodatkowo wesprzeć realizację założeń nowego pakietu gazowego i budowy rynku zielonych gazów. Nie bez powodu opiniujemy te akty prawne w ramach jednej procedury legislacyjnej. Należy jednak pamiętać, aby przepisy dotyczące emisji metanu były wdrażane z dużą roztropnością oraz z uwzględnieniem przejściowości. Konieczne jest, by obowiązki w zakresie monitorowania, raportowania i redukowania emisji metanu zostały dostosowane czasowo, w taki sposób, by regiony Unii Europejskiej oraz poszczególne firmy zdołały przygotować swoje zaplecze techniczne, kadrowe i metodologiczne. Szczególnie ważne jest, by nowo wprowadzone przepisy zapewniały nam realizację celów klimatycznych i strategicznych, ale jednocześnie uwzględniały pozycję wielu interesariuszy, a także wyjątkowo trudną sytuację na obecnym rynku energetycznym. Mam nadzieję, że nowy pakiet gazowy oraz rozporządzenie metanowe, na treścią których pracujemy, będą aktami prawnymi zapewniającymi początek nowego rozdziału w europejskiej energetyce. Życzę sobie oraz Państwu, by regiony i gminy, które reprezentujemy, mogły wspólnie zbudować niezależny, niezależny oraz zrównoważony sektor gazowy przyszłości, zapewniając Unii Europejskiej mocną i bezpieczną pozycję na arenie światowej. Na koniec chciałbym podziękować wszystkim członkom Komitetu Regionów i Komisji ENWE, którzy aktywnie włączyli się w proces przygotowania tej opinii. Od początku procesu jej przygotowania zależało mi na tym, aby odzwierciedlała w najwyższym możliwym stopniu poglądy regionów z całej Unii Europejskiej. Stąd moje liczne konsultacje z Państwem, a także moje przychylne stanowisko wobec 13 z 15 złożonych na sesję plenarną poprawek. Poprawki nr 7 i 12 odnoszą się do kluczowych założeń opinii, wobec których wypracowaliśmy już wspólny, satysfakcjonujący kompromis na poziomie Komisji Enwy. I to są jedyne dwie poprawki, które sugerują, aby Państwo odrzucili. Dziękuję również za współpracę przy przygotowaniu tej opinii mojemu ekspertowi, panu profesorowi Grzegorzowi Chorkowi z Uniwersytetu Warszawskiego, a także sekretariatom Komisji Enwy i mojej grupy politycznej. Bardzo dziękuję. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, uh, rapporteur. Now we will enter in the debate phase, and since our um, guests, um, ACOP, as to may have to uh, leave a little bit earlier, I will now pass the floor to him for three minutes for any additional remarks he wishes to make. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And, and indeed, apologies that I have to leave. Uh, I have to leave to one of these other lovely buildings that we have in Brussels, the European Parliament. Um, maybe just because I think a lot has been said, and, and that's, uh, th that's all very important. And indeed, this is also why in the European Parliament's resolution, it will be hopefully adopted next week in the plenary of the European Parliament in Strasbourg, is that we are also very clearly calling for recognition of a formal role also of, of local and regional authorities. I think why this is so important, and 
What we need to make sure is that this is not going to be seen as a fight for competence. Why is this some, sometimes so sensitive? We are very well aware that the United Nations is built on national authorities. And that's not what we are challenging here, because we know national decisions have to be taken. But the point is that the debate on climate change has moved on. First of all, everyone is talking about it is now about implementation. We have done a lot of political acceptance. We are not having a debate anymore why, whether we need to do it. It's now a debate. What are we going to do? And that's implementation. And for implementation, you need local and regional authorities. Secondly, climate change impact is real. And we see that on a daily basis. And we will see that more and more. And how to deal with that, how to prepare for that, how to adapt to that is in the hands of local and regional authorities. So it would be very surreal to have that discussion without local and regional authorities. And also the third element, when we are implementing and when we are looking at the impacts, it is, of course, also that climate change is more and more also a social policy. It's not that you have here green policy and you have social policy there on the other side. They are inherently connected. And if you look at the challenges that we are having around us also on energy poverty, then these needs to be addressed together. And also here it's local and regional authorities who are the closest to these elements. And for these reasons, it's so important that we don't say this is a replacement of the national responsibilities, but this is a necessary, complementary addition that we need to implement not only in the European Union, but certainly also at the global level. And that's also why we will fight to maintain this point also in the European Parliament's resolution and also to make sure that together we bring this message when we go to Sharm el-Sheikh. Once again, I would like to thank you very much. Again, my apologies that I have to leave. Uh, it's, it's, well, the other Parliament also needs to work. Uh, so I will go there now, and I really would like to thank you very much, and good luck with all the issues that we are having at hand around climate, energy, and social policies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give the floor to our member, Marku Markula, for two minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. President. It's really good so that I can directly continue about the implementation, what we just heard uh, said by the representative of the European Parliament, because implementation is what matters. As uh, the mayor of Utrecht, uh, Sharon Dixma, what you stressed that cities can be the game changers. Actually, cities need to be game changers. And that's all what we can do. And when we talk here about cities, it's not only civil servants and politicians, it's all the whole city community. And with the community, I especially stress all, including industry, uh, educational and research establishments, from schools and kindergartens to top universities, and it's all citizens, citizen communities. And that's what makes the big difference. And that's what is my EPP message to the uh, next COP as well. I've personally been in four COPs uh, physically, so I know what it is, and I know that the future needs to be more that we are showcasing in concrete terms so what uh, uh, the cities with the whole communities can do. In it's, so it's not only what, what the implementation needs to be, but how we make that to happen. And on that, so when you, uh, Mayor, uh, referred to the 100 climate uh, neutral cities, so we need to take those showcases. So my challenge uh, to uh, the coming COPs is that the CR we need to organize so that we are more concretely there and so we, through that, convince uh, the national delegates and UN so it's time to get the cities and regional authorities to play a really instrumental role as official partners in these negotiations. And we have many of these instruments uh, in our use, the, the uh, missions, the innovation agenda and so on. Let's showcase how we move, move to action. Thank you. Now the floor goes to a member of our Young Elected Politicians program, Milena Noncheva. You have the floor for one minute.
Thank you. Uh, I will talk about climate change and impact on energy carriers and energy producers. The most serious factor playing a role in global climate change is the production of energy carriers and their subsequent use for energy production, containing a carbon footprint. This is the main reason for the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and subsequently disrupting and normally for all life determining natural features such as the water and soil. The production and use of renewable energy source and the use of clean, carbon-free energy is a challenge and a task before the whole world with a view of protecting life on the planet. I'm a municipal councillor in a small average municipality for Bulgaria Montana municipality. That is why I want to share my own analysis of all these processes such as projections in my native municipality and the effect of future processes concerning the economy, ecologic, climate symbiosis. Montana has a favorable business economic climate. More than six enterprises are in the top 50 for Bulgaria and terms for economics indicators even a leading position in Europe and the world. Over the past two years, our municipality has seen an exceptional growth in the number of permits issued for the construction of a small and large photovoltaic plants for businesses and households. With the tenfold increase in the price of energy, every route to business area in Montana becomes a photovoltaic plant for its own energy needs. In this way, the businesses normalize energy consumption for previous levels. The energy trends, even in my small town, are such that in the next five years, every business and large part of household will have their own independent energy resources, 100% carbon free. Here is my analysis of this situation with the following future findings. There will be a large production of daily electricity in the result of this process. The price of electricity will become stable and predictable for a long period of time. The need for daily electricity will decrease, which means that there will be a huge surplus at peak times of the middle part of the day with the greatest sunshine. These micro-level findings in a small municipality like Montana are a reflection of global trends. The alternatives for harvesting energy peaks and not wasting produced electricity at the moment are the storage and storage batteries for subsequent utilization or electricity production of hydrogen and oxygen from water. Batteries are an effectionally way to store energy, but with a short circle life in this technological stage. The problem is that during their production and when they are taken out of use, there is an extremely serious carbon footprint on nature. This issue is another way with technologies that convert solar energy into hydrogen, which is stored for use in a dark hours of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much for your participation. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to our member, Kata Tuto. Thank you very much for the floor. First of all, I would like to thank the work of the rapporteurs, uh, and I would like to absolutely thank Alison Gillen for highlighting uh, the women's perspective. We've been talking about the coming energy crisis where women will have a heavier burden on their shoulders. But about... Today's discussion, yes, so we are talking about four pillars. Yes, we've talked about mitigation, so uh, reducing CO2, adaptation, uh, loss and damage. We never talked about biodiversity, that's the third pillar. But the fourth pillar, that's the social pillar, I think that's one of the most important. So when we talk about bridging gaps, yes, cities can bridge gaps of ambition. But I think what is very important now is to bridge gap between the climate goals and our citizens. Because we are asking a lot from our citizens. Uh, and I know the active citizens, the ambition citizens, they turn up at the conference on the future of Europe. They are pushing for more. But we mayors actually meet the silent majority of our citizens, who we ask a lot to buy less, turn off heating, don't use cars, uh, uh, change your life, everything. And when I see the data, I've seen the fresh data from Germany where the most wealthiest 10% uh, use as much energy as the 40% on the lowest end. And if I have to guess who will 
turn off heating and who will eat less, it will be the lowest 40% and not the 10% giving up private jets and giving up private uh, swimming pools. So when we talk about social justice, when we talk about a just transition, this is not about being nice. This is about not losing our citizens, not losing the majority of our citizens. Uh, just transition is a, the only way to succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now the floor goes to a member of Young Elected Politicians Program, e minha compatriota, Bruna Queiroz Carneiro. Tem a palavra por um minuto. Good morning, everyone. I will speak in my mother language and I appreciate your comprehension. Uma forma de mitigar as alterações climáticas em vários países seria com a implementação do turismo sustentável. Assim, promoveríamos as regiões e posicionávamos as nossas regiões como comunidades sustentáveis. Creio que podemos premiar e reconhecer fiscal e socialmente os territórios que aliem a sustentabilidade ao turismo, assegurando que os momentos de lazer, geralmente caracterizados por maiores custos ambientais para o planeta, fruto de comportamentos menos regrados, são também capazes de contribuir para a transição climática. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Now the floor goes to our member Chouvet for two minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président, et uh, quelle bonne idée d'avoir uh, invité des uh, jeunes élus uh, à notre débat, car comme l'a dit Rafael Trajkowski tout à l'heure, uh, ce n'est pas le combat de la prochaine génération, mais c'est uh, clairement le combat de notre génération, la lutte contre le réchauffement climatique. Et je voudrais uh, saluer ce qui a été dit par uh, le membre du Parlement européen qui était là tout à l'heure, où il faut, pour cette COP27, à laquelle nous participerons évidemment avec une ambition forte, que l'ensemble des institutions européennes et des élus qui seront là-bas forment un vrai pack autour de la Commission, avec le Parlement et avec le Comité des Régions, comme cela avait commencé à se faire à Glasgow, pour que nous puissions porter d'une seule voix la voix de notre bloc, de notre bloc européen. Et nous, en tant que représentants du comité des régions, bien sûr, nous devons faire remonter vers les institutions et vers les négociations internationales nos préoccupations, mais nous avons aussi à faire redescendre vers nos citoyens. Et s'il si y avait un message que je voulais passer à mes collègues, c'est n'ayez pas peur de dire, quand vous rentrez dans vos circonscriptions, que l'Union européenne est le bloc mondial le plus ambitieux et le plus sérieux sur le climat, le plus ambitieux parce que nous allons porter cette ambition et le plus sérieux parce que nous la transcrivons immédiatement dans notre droit interne et c'est notamment le, le paquet Fit for 55 qui avait été euh, évoqué tout à l'heure. Alors je serai moins optimiste néanmoins sur euh, le fait de pouvoir l'atteindre voire de le dépasser parce que nous sommes déjà euh, presque en 2023, les objectifs sont sur 2030 et un certain nombre de communes ne sont pas des grandes villes. Euh, je salue le, le, les envies d'avancer du Trert et, et de, de Varsovie, mais dans des plus petites communes ou des plus petites villes, eh bien, il manque de l'ingénierie, euh, il manque des ressources, il manque du savoir-faire, il manque du personnel, euh, il manque de la matière grise pour pouvoir euh, avancer aussi vite. Et on le sait, deux tiers des investissements euh, pour lutter contre le changement climatique ou s'adapter au changement climatique seront faits par euh, les régions et notamment les régions rural. C'est pour cela qu'il faudra aussi compter, et j'en terminerai par là, Monsieur le Président, avec l'ensemble des maires, y compris les maires africains, y compris les maires africains de la francophonie, pour que nous soyons à la fois un pack européen et une famille de maires unis à Charm el Sheikh. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Now the floor goes to uh, young elected politicians. Member Pablo Baena, you have the floor for one minute. Gracias, Presidente. La Unión Europea, a través de sus instituciones, debe seguir esforzándose para acercarse a las regiones que forman parte de ella y, por lo tanto, a sus ciudadanos. Son los ciudadanos de Europa lo que debe importarnos y, por eso, las instituciones europeas deben conocer sus necesidades para dar una respuesta adecuada a las mismas. En mi caso, mi región es La Rioja, una pequeña comunidad en el norte de España, eh, con un importante carácter rural y un serio problema de déficit en infraestructuras, de transporte y movilidad, como también sucede en otras regiones de Europa. Y el Comité debe ser consciente de que ello genera problemas de desindustrialización y envejecimiento poblacional, entre muchos otros. Por ello, el Comité 
debe impulsar una correcta estrategia para el desarrollo social de lo, en los entornos rurales, así como una adecuada planificación de las infraestructuras que conecten nuestros territorios y que conecten, por lo tanto, a nuestros ciudadanos. Europa, eh, como quería trasladarles, debe servir a sus ciudadanos, porque esa es la forma de que ellos quieran seguir construyendo más Europa. Por lo tanto, encontrar el camino para seguir desarrollando el bienestar de nuestras comunidades y continuar involucrando a los ciudadanos en la construcción de Europa son objetivos fundamentales que deben ir imbricados en las políticas que se apliquen para hacer frente al cambio climático. Esta es la reflexión que quería compartir con todos ustedes. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Now the floor goes to our member, Boca, for two minutes. You have the floor. Two minutes. Köszönöm a szót, elnök úr. Tisztelt a bizottság Balatonfüred egy tóparti település polgármestereként nagy örömmel szolgál, hogy az idén Egyiptomban megrendezésre kerülő COP27 konferencia egyik napjának a témája a víz lesz. Egyiptomhoz kapcsolódóan ki nem tanulmányaiból az ókori Egyiptom gazdag öntözés és mezőgazdaságára és kultúrájára. És kéne figyelni aggodalommal az elmúlt évszerek elsivatagosodásának növekvő mértékét, a kialakuló vízhiányokat, melyet csak tovább fokozhat a Nírus felső folyásán épült nagy etió pújjás születésgát, mely idén megkezdte az energiatermelést. Az idén nyáron tapasztalt szárazság Európa szerte is rámutatott az éghajati váltás válság súlyosbodására és arra, hogy a vízhiány egy nagyobb területeket és gazdasági ágazatokat érint. Ugyancsak megmutatta, hogy az éghajat változás hatásai ellen legközvetlenebből helyi, regionális szinten lehet és kell is küzdeni. A vízbiztonsági, vízgazdálkodási projektekben úgy ítélem meg, hogy Európa az élen jár. Ezért nekünk, polgármestereknek és régiós elnököknek azt kell tennünk, hogy bemutatjuk a különböző típusú vízügyi projekteket, amelyek segíthetnek a közösségeknek az éghajat változás hatásaihoz való alkalmazkodásban és új projektek finanszírozási lehetőségeinek a fentáv Ezen a lehetséges közös úton már elindultunk. Ezzel kapcsolatban a vízfontosságával kapcsolatban az ENDE szakbizottság 2008. június 28-án kejjelt konferenciát szervezett Magyarországon a Balatonnál fenntartható fejlődési célok megvalósulása az Európai Tavak térségében címmel és remély, és bízunk a folytatásban. 2023-ban, 9 év után újra Európában, ezúttal Magyarországon kerül megrendezésre a tavak világtalálkozója, melynek társzervezője az általam elnökölt Balatonfejlesztési Tanács. Szeretnénk önöket meghívni esetleg egy szekció vagy kérdés ülés alkalmából. Mutassuk meg a nemzetközi közösség minél szélesebb körének erőfeszítéseinket, hogy közösen tudjuk megóvni értékeinket, vízeinket. Thank you. Now the floor goes to a young elected politician. Is on, she's online. Alessandra Gallego Bresan, you have the floor for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, everyone. If I don't preserve the environment, I don't preserve myself. It is precisely taking a cue from what was said by Ortega Gasat that politics must take the initiative to propose evolutionary steps in this sense. But what role can we local administration play to the, uh, so that we can correct past mistakes and develop a top of environmental protection? One of the objectives must be to preserve and pass on the great legacy that we have inherited in cultural, philosophical and economic terms, but above all, the naturalistic one. In Italy, for example, the national government that will soon take office will have to play an active and proactive role during the negotiations of the Fit for 55 package, with the aim of defending and protecting the interests of the national industrial and production system, balancing it with the global ecosystem. Not only that, but we only we hope also to have a leading to be a leading actor in the fight against environmental dumping at the European level through the instrument of Libyan products made with materials and methods that are not in line with the environmental standards required of our company. And it appears that in Italy we do have a national plan for adaptation to climate change, ready since 2017, 
which however has never been put into operation to date. I therefore start to conclude underlining how already for those from these first references, we can see well defined the way to follow for a local involvement of the universities and professional excellencies who are now at our disposal to update uh, this plan and make it operational as soon as possible. In Thank time you. also even for the Strano Shea Convention. Thank you, Mr. President, and Thank good, you. a good job for us. Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Now the floor goes to our member, Kobor, for two minutes. <clears throat> dear, dear colleagues, we said it many times that the transition to climate neutrality will succeed only if everyone takes the ownership of the transition, if citizens, communities feel that their contribution matters. But how is it possible in a war and sanction environment maintaining a war instead of peace? In times of high and volatile energy prices, we clearly see the need to move more towards local sources source of energy and empower local authorities to close the emission gap. At the moment, renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. fuels. We have to take this opportunity to change the system and renew our commitments. But, but how is this possible when all uh, local governments now have to recalculate their budgets because of the terrible acute energy cost and instead of improvements, restrictions must be introduced in the communal services, services with technological setbacks. For instance, heating with coal and wood instead of gas in some schools institutions or reducing of the city lighting. We would like IPCC 2022 report on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability to be reflected in the EU position. And, but for us local governments, the boundary conditions are extremely poor now. It is important uh, that EU as well as international community uh, supports local green deals and implementation of place-based climate contracts designed in cooperation with citizens and key stakeholders. We need direct support to cities. I am proud my city uh, PH will be one of the selected 100 participating in EU climate neutral cities by 2030 supported by the EU, but we are also fighting with and we also have the mentioned problems. Thank you. Thank you. Now the floor goes to young elected politician, Monika Andrasek. You have the floor for one minute. Köszönöm. Üdvözlöm Önöket. Andrasek Monika vagyok. Érd városából érkeztem, hogy önkormányzati képviselőként dolgozom. Földrajzi helyzetünkből adódóan városunk az agglomerációs települések összes problémáját hordozza. A városvezetés forrásai szűkösek, mert a jelenlegi kormány forrásokat von meg az úgynevezett ellenzéki vezetésű településektől. Ezért is fontos, hogy a hozzánk hasonló települések közvetlen támogatást kapjanak. Ilyen körülmények között igyekszünk zöld válaszokat adni a felmerülő problémákra. Hiszek abban, hogy a jelenlegi energiaválság lehetőség a paradigmaváltásra, ezért arra buzdítom az uniós szerveket, hogy minél előbb ültessük át a gyakorlatba a Green Deal-t, és minél előbb szerezzünk érvényt az európai klímajognak. Hiszem, hogy a helyi közösségek támogatásával lelassíthatjuk a klímaváltozás tragikus hatásait. Köszönöm. Thank you. Now we'll go to member Schatten. You have the floor for two minutes. Mariki Schatten, you have the floor for two minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, we are on the way to COP27 and uh, much is at stake. Um, previous speakers have emphasized this in many different words. And as a delegation of the Committee of the Regions, we will again emphasize the ro role of local governments. And we are really pleased uh, by the appointment of Ms. Dijksma as a special envoy, because I think that will be helpful for us as well. But, Mr. Chairman, what else can we do to include citizens we represent and work to together on a more hopeful uh, perspective? Because it is ultimately about a major social and societal transition that we are in the midst in. Citizens and politicians are dealing with climate change, with high inflation, with rising uh, energy prices, and 
That requires a coherent story, a step-by-step -step approach with measures that explain why we do them, for whom, and what kind of impact they will have. And I want to highlight three topics briefly. Adaptation and mitigation is thinking global and acting local. And many of us are doing that already. And we can do more. We can take more mitigating measures by reducing further global, global emissions. And that applies in particular to the richer countries with a high footprint. For example, by reducing the demand for energy, adopting food change, and stopping the production of energy-intensive consumer goods with a very short lifespan. Secondly, and that has been mentioned before as well, um, loss and damage and climate finance. This will be a very important topic at the Climate Summit. Who pays for the damage used by climate change? This asks for very transparent international cooperation between ourselves and beyond the European Union, based on climate justice and based on efficiency. And thirdly, I think we also require more courageous cooperation, which will help us, from local governments with national governments and vice versa, of course, but also with working with young professionals who are really motivated to work with us and collaboration between the different generations. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Now the floor goes to a young elected politician, Clara Elstrom. You have the floor for one minute. Thank you so much for giving me the floor. Uh, as has been pointed out, pointed out today, for many cities and regions, the consequence of climate change is sadly already a fact, and we are handling the urgent need for local adaption already. I would also like to raise that many cities and regions already have their own structures for cooperation on climate change between local decision makers, civil societies, uh, authorities and, and local businesses, all partners contributing within their specific reach. And this is an op opportunity to take responsibility beyond our own organizations to strive for a fair and impactful tra transition of the whole society. So in particular, I would like to emphasize also the importance of including youth in these dialogues, uh, not only because uh, they will be there to experience future consequences of climate change, but also because many of the young people today has grown up with it. Um, so I follow the opinion on the, uh, on the structural inclusion of cities and regions in COP27 that, that has been discussed today, and I can only agree on the importance of the local level. Thank you. Thank you. Now the floor goes to our member, Josef Frey. You have the floor for one minute. Herr Präsident, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, leider finde ich die Dringlichkeit der Energiewende und die notwendige Dekarbonisierung in der vorliegenden Stellungnahme im Energiepaket noch nicht genug vertreten. Uns muss doch allen klar sein, dass Methanemissionen eine zentrale Rolle spielen bei der globalen Erwärmung und müssen so schnell wie möglich gesenkt werden. Die Förderung von Methan als Brennstoff in dieser Stellungnahme gefordert, schafft deshalb falsche Anreize. Die ausschließliche Produktion von Pflanzen für Biogasanlagen und die Fortführung einer Intensivtierhaltung zur Gewinnung von Biogas und Biomethan müssen ausgeschlossen werden von einer Förderung. Deshalb bitte ich um Unterstützung für unsere Anträge. Wir müssen jetzt alles tun, um unsere Wirtschaft vollständig auf erneuerbare Energien umzustellen, um Klima und Umwelt und den Geldbeutel zu schonen und von Energieimporten unabhängig zu werden. Thank you. Now the floor goes to our member Ufu Kaya. You have the floor for one minute. Dank u, voorzitter. Ik zal in het Nederlands spreken en heet burgemeester Dijksma warm welkom in ons comité. Voorzitter, alhoewel mijn stad, Den Bosch, zich trots voorbereidt op de viering van haar 850-jarig bestaan, ben ik doordrongen van het feit dat als de regenbui van vorig jaar juli 50 kilometer westelijker waren gevallen, mijn stad overstroomd was en ons historisch erfgoed twee meter onder water had gestaan. Uh, MEP Eikhout wees ook op de wereldwijde rampen door klimaat. We moeten globaal denken, maar lokaal acteren. En daarom zou COP27 drie zaken moeten borgen. 
De EU en nationale overheden zouden mogelijkmaker moeten zijn van de regio's, zowel financieel als juridisch. De klimaat- en energietransitie vraagt ook om een verandering van een centraal systeem naar een decentraal systeem met ruimte voor lokale diversiteit aan duurzame energiebronnen. En tot slot, deze transitie is onmiskenbaar ook een sociale transitie, die alleen kan slagen als we onze onderwijs- en arbeidsmarkt onderdeel maken van de aanpak. Alleen dan kunnen de afspraken die gemaakt worden in COP27 slagen. Dank u wel. Thank you. Now the floor goes to our member Barbara Egedus. One minute. Köszönöm szépen a szót. Nagyon fontos, hogy a globális célokra lokális megoldásokat találjunk, hogy élhetőbb és fenntarthatóbb legyen a környezetünk. Az elmúlt évben nagyon komoly problémákat tapasztaltunk az éghajlatváltozással kapcsolatban, például hőhullámokat, szárazságot. A jelenlegi energiaválság lépésekre kényszerített minket, megnőtt az igény a megújuló energiaforrások iránt, azonban azt is tapasztaltuk, hogy egyes államokban növelni kellett a nagyobb károsanyag kibocsátású energiatermelés, például a szénerőművek használatát. A zöld átállás nagyon fontos, azonban nem mehet végbe egyik napról a másikra. A települések a jelenlegi helyzetben nem tudnak fejlesztéseket végrehajtani. A egyes településeken, például Veszfőnben is, a városomban, vagy Magyarország számos településen azon kell gondolkodnunk, hogy közintézményeket, sportlétesítményeket kell bezárni az energiaválság miatt. Arra kell törekedni, hogy a béke minél előbb megszülethessen, és a fenntarthatóság célkitűzéseit valóban meg tudjuk valósítani. Köszönöm. Thank you. Now the floor goes to our member Uwe Konrad for one minute. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, dear colleagues, uh, the COP26 had a participant list of 1,616 pages. More than 10,000 members attended it. Unfortunately, only less than 5% of all participants were local or regional uh, representatives. But even when it comes to the actual meeting who had access the members, there were even a lot less mayors and other local representatives that had this access. They were mostly left out. This must finally stop. In this context, I call on the national governments to include local delegates in the national negotiation delegations to the UNFCCC climate summits. I thank the rapporteur for supporting my motion on this, uh, the participation of communities should also be given greater consideration at the EU UN. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now the floor goes to our member, Guter Platter, not before pointing out to all members that this seems to be Mr. Platter's last plenary session after around 14 years with us, between being member, alternate member, and full member, I would like to thank him for his work in our institution and wish you, on behalf of the Committee of the Regions, all the best. You have the floor for one minute. Ja, danke, Herr Präsident, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ja, es stimmt dass das heute meine letzte Sitzung ist. Nach 36 Jahren in der Politik habe ich mich selbst entschieden, die Politik zu verlassen und meine Nachfolge geregelt. Das ist nicht immer so der Fall und das ist für mich eine erfreuliche Angelegenheit. Ich habe in diesen 36 Jahren alle Ebenen der Politik kennengelernt als Bürgermeister, dann war ich Nationalratsabgeordneter, sechs Jahre in der Bundesregierung in Österreich als Verteidigungsminister, Innenminister und jetzt über 14 Jahre als Landeshauptmann von Tirol. Ich möchte nur eine kleine Bemerkung machen, denn ich möchte hier diese heutige Tagung nicht aufhalten. Aber entscheidend ist aus meiner Sicht schon, was den Klimawandel betrifft, dass wir uns mit der Verkehrsfrage noch massiv auseinandersetzen. Und ich predige das eigentlich schon seit Jahrzehnten, dass wir einfach überbelastet sind, was den Transitschwerverkehr betrifft. Die Belastungsgrenze für Mensch, Natur und für die Infrastruktur ist bei weitem überschritten. Und wir haben in verschiedenen anderen Branchen die Emissionen reduziert. 
Aber beim Verkehr haben wir mehr Emissionen, wie das eigentlich früher der Fall war. Und wir müssen dringend diesen Transit Schwerverkehr reduzieren. Nur ein Beispiel. 71 Prozent der Güter werden bei uns in Europa über den Brenner äh, auf der Straße befördert und 29 Prozent auf der Schiene. In der Schweiz ist es umgekehrt. 70 Prozent der Güter werden auf der Schiene befördert und 30 Prozent auf der Straße, weil es dort wesentlich teurer ist, äh, die Beförderung der Güter auf der Straße. Deshalb meine ich, dass es hier schon einen Schulterschluss benötigt. Äh, da, wir werden einen riesen Stau haben in Tirol, wenn Sie Richtung Süden fahren. Es müssen die Straßen, die Brücken saniert werden. Nur ein Fahrstreifen bleibt frei, weil die Infrastruktur es ebenfalls nicht mehr schafft. Das wollte ich nur noch sagen, äh, wollte nicht unangenehm auffallen, aber ich meine schon, dass äh, diese Angelegenheit äh, Schwerverkehr im Bereich des Transit dringend äh, angegangen werden muss. Und ich glaube, dass gerade dieses Gremium ganz entscheidend ist für diese Themen, für Klimawandel. Wir sind ein Europa der Regionen und die Regionen haben aber auch das Sagen, nicht nur die Nationalstaaten. Herzlichen Dank. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this concludes our uh, request for the floor. Now we go to final remarks. Uh, we will start with Mayor Dixma. Uh, you have three minutes. Well, thank you first, uh, first of all um, for uh, all your um, support, actually. I have been uh, listening to you, and I think that... Uh, you stated out very clearly why cities could be the game changer, because they are not only part of the problem uh, if it comes to the pollution, but they are definitely part of uh, the uh, solution. And uh, I think that we could perfectly make that clear, that if you need to um, uh, put your money where your mouth is, so to say, that you need uh, the cities and the regions. And the idea of, for instance, having uh, local uh, authorities within the national delegations towards COP, uh, which Mr. Conrad was stating, is, I think, a great uh, uh, idea. And also, I think that we should emphasize on the fact that within the national determined contributions, that what, uh, for instance, the cities are, are uh, delivering must be much more uh, uh, in, 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 uh, inside and it needs to be taken account upon. So um, that is, I think, something which we can also ask our national governments. And finally, what I would like to uh, say is that, uh, uh, especially uh, Mrs. Tuto, I hope you, I pronounce it well, and some other uh, delegates here uh, stated the importance of having a, a social and a just transition. And I think that as a mayor, I can see that I have this silent majority within uh, my city. And many people support the climate policy because they understand that it is necessary, but it is also a burden to them. Because you are fully right, we ask a lot of our citizens, and especially a lot that they cannot do anymore or they should change their behavior. And I think that we can only have... Um, real support, public support, if we would benefit uh, those people who are the most vulnerable, the first from this transition. And that's not going to be easy, actually. This is something you need to uh, really uh, interfere. Because if you are not uh, interfering in this transition with a social agenda, then we all know who would benefit the most. And that will be the people who already benefit the most uh, uh, in this uh, world as it is. So uh, I would emphasize on the fact that many mayors also within the ECLI uh, um, uh, community state that this social and just transition is something which is really necessary. 
thank you very much for your support. So please all uh, support our call to action. I have two uh, of my uh, uh, co-workers here with me, and we, you can uh, um, uh, tell them that you would uh, support, and then we take you on the list. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to share uh, your views. Uh, it, it has been a real honor and pleasure. Now the floor goes to our member, Rafael Traskowski, for three minutes. Yes, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I, I would like to thank you very much for all your contributions, and I think that uh, the scope of the debate proves that the local and regional uh, governments have quite a lot to contribute in the debates uh, that we are going to have uh, in, at COP uh, and uh, influence the debate and uh, explain to the member states who are at the end of the day are going to take the decisions that there is no time to waste and that even though we are in crisis and even though we now need to concentrate on the people, on energy poverty, on the prices of energy, uh, we need uh, also to... Uh, realize our ambitions and that we have to do the two things simultaneously. And I think that also this debate has uh, proved uh, uh, beyond any doubt that we are really good at creating uh, platforms in which all of the important voices from the local and regional authorities are being heard. Uh, uh, and the Committee of the, region is a, of the Regions is a focal point where such a debate can be uh, held. Uh, and, of course, we are active within the United Nations. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, our colleagues who are in contact with other cities in the world. Many of us are members of other, uh, of other networks, uh, such as C40, which is meeting. Uh, uh, many, many mayors are meeting next, next uh, week in uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, we should use uh, all of those platforms in order to send the clear message that, um, that we uh, have the contribution to make, that at the end of the day we are responsible for implementing these uh, measures. And I wanted also to thank uh, our young politicians from YEP, because this is immensely crucial that they, their voice is being heard as well. And I think that uh, now we need to concentrate on the most important priorities. Uh, we need to keep on pushing uh, the Council uh, and the European Council to acknowledge uh, our role uh, because at the end of the day we are fighting exactly for the same cause uh, and at the end of the day we cannot uh, simply turn a blind eye to what is happening. So yet again, we are aware of the crisis and multiple crises because we are on the front line all the time even though sometimes the prerogatives are not ours because the, it's not us who are responsible for the pandemics, the local levels, yet we were uh, doing it. It is not us who are responsible for migration policy, yet we are helping the refugees. It is not us who are responsible for the energy crisis, yet we are at the forefront. That's why our voice has to be heard, because at the same time, we are helping the people, we hear the voice, but we are not going to, uh, to diminish our ambitions. Thank you very much. Muito... Muito obrigado, muito obrigado, Rafael, pelo contributo e pela... Muito obrigado, Presidente. Eu é que agradeço. Now the floor goes to our um, guest, Sef Sefiani. I think he's online. If you would like to have a final remarks, you have the floor for three minutes. Uh, it seems... It seems uh, no. Now I will go to the rapporteurs to final remarks. We'll start. We'll start with uh, the rapporteur, our member Alison Gilliland, for three minutes. Thank you very much, President. I actually won't uh, take three minutes. I think we are all very much on the same page. We all want to be involved. We are doing the work, but we want the recognition. So to add to uh, Mayor Dimska's call to action, I would ask all you, my colleagues, our core members, in a call to action to contact your national delegations, your European Parliament members ahead of COP, but most importantly ahead of the European Parliament resolution uh, at the end of this month, and ensure that there is an explicit reference 
to the role of cities and regions, to direct financing and support for us and for our voice at that table. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now the floor goes to uh, the Rapporteur Czeltkowski. You have the floor for three minutes. Szanowni Państwo, Szanowni Przewodniczący, bardzo dobra debata. Ja zawsze to powtarzam na szczeblu lokalnym, regionalnym, ale też tutaj na szczeblu Komitetu Regionów, że my jako regiony, jako miasta musimy przyspieszać i zgadzam się tutaj z wszystkimi opiniami, że te kompetencje regionalne, lokalne powinny być większe, bo samorządy zawsze dają zmiany i zawsze dają radę w wielu obszarach. Dlatego te wszystkie zmiany klimatyczne, szczególnie w takim regionie jak mój, czyli Śląsk, który jest mocno zurbanizowany, mocno industrialny, jest jednym z największych póki co regionów węglowych w Europie, wymagają dynamicznych zmian i się bardzo cieszę, że tutaj cała Europa samorządowa mówi jednym głosem. Bardzo dziękuję za wszystkie uwagi, ale musimy też uwzględniać przy wszystkich zmianach systemowych stopień rozwoju poszczególnych regionów, ich możliwości gospodarcze, możliwość zachowania konkurencyjności gospodarki. Dlatego te wszystkie nasze opinie muszą być zrównoważone, które będą jednocześnie pokazywały równość szans w tych wszystkich zmianach. Wiadomo, że Polska czy Europa Środkowo-Wschodnia do tych zmian dochodzi trudniej z uwagi na ustrój, który rządził wiele, wiele lat temu i te niestety grzechy z przeszłości na dzień dzisiejszy są obciążeniem, ale głęboko w to wierzę, że gdy będziemy mocno, dobrze pracować i ta debata, i nasze opinie, i COP, który będzie w Egipcie spowoduje, że dojdzie do bardzo dobrych, dynamicznych zmian. Bardzo dziękuję. Thank you. And now include the remarks, final remarks. I give the floor to our member Gablewicz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would start uh, with a confession that during my first intervention, uh, unfortunately, I made an unforgettable mistake because I forgot to thank, uh, to thank my reporter, Sylvia Wiskawka. Thank you very much. I would like to thank my all CIVEX friends for a trust, all CIVEX and EPP staff for a very brilliant cooperation when preparing uh, my opinion. I think that after this discussion we are all aware that meeting uh, our climate goals it is not only multi-level but, uh, but also multidisciplinary task and, uh, and we see on, on how many areas we have to work and we have to cooperate together. So my opinion is about this, uh, this social than they mention, uh, which Catituto uh, mentioned. We have to convince our people. We have to have them on our common board. But what is even more difficult, uh, in my opinion, it, it is to convince the people outside of Europe when the level of awareness is not so high. So that's why we have to, we have to cooperate very closely with our neighboring uh, uh, the, the, the towns, cities, villages in our neighboring countries. And it is, uh, it is also very, very important to convince them and to exert from the bottom once again, so I would like to repeat, the pressure on the government in the neighboring countries. After this discussion, we see that we have a lot to do as a committee of regions. But we have to uh, create a see that we managed to create a good team spirit and we can cooperate between the different uh, committees uh, to, to, to achieve our climate goals. So let's uh, do all together. Let's strengthen a committee of regions uh, and make it visible during, uh, during upcoming COP27. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now we um, we gonna vote. I would like to ask Vice President uh, Robbie. B